We're having a fine Wednesday. Um, okay, so I finished three point six yesterday. Today I'm gonna talk about three point seven. So what am I gonna talk about? So um, if you look at three point seven. You, you will see it's titled Derivatives in Natural and Social Sciences or something like that. Um, so it's basically um, real life examples of derivatives. Um, so basically, essentially there's no math, there's no new math in this chapter. Um, But it's just trying to convince you that um, there's a lot of derivatives in a lot of places. Uh, basically, there's derivatives everywhere. Uh, I don't find this the the examples in this chapter incredibly convincing. Maybe that maybe that's just me. Uh, or maybe it's because I think that derivatives are even more omnipresent than the book is trying to tell us. But the thing is, um, the, reason, the reason that examples in math classes never feel remotely close to real life is that, well, real life is more complicated. Sometimes you need more math to understand an actual real life problem. Sometimes you need more of something that's not math and can't help you there. I don't know anything that's not math. I barely know how to use Zoom. I don't think that makes me a computer scientist. <clears throat> so, uh, I forgot to join with my phone in case everyone, everything dies. But anyway, I'm going to go through some of these examples. Um, Join meeting. So the first example is, uh, so the book goes by which science we're learning. So by the way, so in case it's not clear, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm never gonna ask you to know physics or chemistry or biology or econ or anything. Uh, you might get a problem in your homework, um, about these things, but they're telling you, in principle, they're telling you everything you need to know about the, the thing, you know, this is not, uh, this is not a class on those things. You, you don't get tested on things that are not math. So, um, but still I'm gonna talk about them. So uh, the first example, or, I don't know, I should, I should recap first. Um, so, when do derivatives show up? Derivatives show up when a when a quantity y depends on another. So it's a function. Uh, so we have that y is a function of x. Then um, the then we can we look at this. Um, it's it's often very useful to look at this uh, quotient. So this is the so. Oops. So this delta meant change. So it means uh, take two quantities and subtract them. <clears throat> and for example, if this was uh, if this was uh, time and uh, space, I would say this is the, the movement as some time has gone by. 
so the difference between x2 and x1 is how much uh, x has changed. It could be time, it could be how much time has passed, it could be literally anything else. Uh, and if I take delta y, this is uh, how much uh, y changes because of the change in x. So what happens is that a lot of the time you would like to um, you would like to see how the change in, in x causes y to change. And in, and you don't so so this is uh, well so then you you take the quotient and this tells you the rate of change. But it gives you um, as you know, this gives you some sort of approximation. I know that if I've driven one mile in one minute, on average, I've gone 60 miles per hour. But that doesn't mean that my speed, uh, but my speed might have been might have been changing. So it's it's only an approximation. So what you really want to do often is to take the limit as the rate of change becomes very, uh, as the change in X becomes very small or the rate of change. And, and this is, oh, this is the derivative. <coughs> is what it is. Um, I don't wanna call it instantaneous because X is not time. But. So I've already told you all of this, but anyway, where are you? Um, if you if you drew the graph of y respect to x, the the um, this instantaneous rate of change would be the slope of the curve, uh, or the slope of the tangent line. Okay, right. so what are some examples of this? Um, so um, the first one that's sort of compulsory to say is velocity and acceleration. And I already talked about this, so I'm not gonna stop very long, but if, um, If an object is moving, we can look at its position. Uh, its position uh, x at time c. Um, so this makes the position a function of time. Uh, if you tell me the time, I tell you where the car was, um, where where the car was at this moment. Um, so obviously, if it's moving in three-dimensional space, position is not going to be, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's moving on a straight road, I guess, because position normally would be uh, three numbers, I guess, but let's just, um, let's just imagine that it's moving on a straight line. So we can do for now. So then what is the, 
what is the average rate of change? Well, we know we know what this is. Um, this is the the change in position divided by the change in time. So well, I'm gonna call it change the time passed. And we have a word for that. It's the it's the average speed. So what happens when you take the derivative? When you when you look at the you look at your average speed over an interval that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you you take the limit as this interval uh, the, the interval's length approaches zero you get the instantaneous speed. Uh, and well, that's a derivative and it measures something we care about greatly. So um, what happens? So let's call this B of T. So now another thing you also already know is that if you take the change in velocity over some amount of time. So if I've gone from zero to 60 in, in 10 seconds, uh, well, uh, that's, that's telling me something. It's telling me uh, that's called the acceleration. The acceleration is how much speed you gain or lose. But again, acceleration is not, we don't care as much about the average as we care about what the acceleration, um, what is happening at an instant. And, and the instantaneous acceleration is is very clear how to measure it in real life uh, because if you're sitting in a car that's accelerating or braking, which is negative acceleration, you feel you feel pushed. Um, if if the car is accelerating, you 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 feel you feel a force pulling you back, and if you the car is braking, a, fo a force pulls you forward. Um, so you don't. You know, this is a derivative, but you don't need to take a derivative to to measure it. You can take, uh, you can just measure the force that you're experiencing by taking some, you know, um, some springs with weights attached to them and seeing how long they, um, how how much they stretch. But anyway, this instantaneous acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And that's it, that's the example. <clears throat> I mean, I could say more about it, but I'm kind of boring myself with acceleration and velocity at this point. So I'm gonna move on to uh, another example in physics that has nothing to do with this, which is a lot more exciting. Um, At least it's new. So, um, what, I, what am I looking at now? Um, so this example has to do with um, mass. So, say you have so say you have an object. Um, the thing is. Often you care about, uh, it seems like at first you learn physics, seems like everything is a point, but actually things are solid. And mass is not located in a point. So um, 
Um, so you might have to worry about how math is distributed. Uh, in, the, in the object, because, um, well, say I throw, I throw this mouse at you. I want to know. I want to know how the weight is distributed to know if, how much it's gonna spin in the air. To know if it's gonna hit you in the head or not. Maybe I want to hit you in the head. Maybe I don't. I don't know why I chose such a valid example. The thing is, things flying is a very good example. Oh, the thing, the thing kids did a few years ago with it, where they threw the half full water bottle and it landed um, straight up. They were taking derivatives in their heads. So, so you have, I don't, I don't even mean to say an object, I mean to say a rod. Again, because I only, I can only use one number. So you have a solid rod of some material. Um, so it's, um, its mass is not the same everywhere. Say uh, that the mass um, between the end and x inches is um, say m of x. So what I'm saying is if I measure x1 inches here, the the mass of the mass of stuff that I have here is um, is some function of this number. So the number is how how far from the left I am. I guess your left is here. Actually, I don't know. You see, it might be a mirror or not. Um, and then. There's a there's a function, and in principle, you might not know about this function. Uh, you, you might not know what it is, or you might. <clears throat> so, um, so I mean, I could have chosen a different way, but I, I can't think of that many more ways to describe. Um, well, I can think of another one, which is the one I'm about to talk about. But how do you describe how mass is distributed in a in a regular thing? Well, I have to tell you, if you look at a chunk of it, how much it weighs. And if I tell you this now, now you can figure out sort of how much every piece of it weighs, weighs by just just subtracting. So. Um, what happens if I do, if I take two, two lengths here and I look at the, the increment in M divided by the increment in X? Uh, so this is what I mean. So X2 minus X1 is gonna be the, it's going to be the, the length of the of the piece between x two and x one. And then the mass. So the difference of mass. Well, this is the the difference in the weight of the the piece that goes up to x. 2 minus the p that goes up to x1. So in a picture, this is this is what it is. Um, it's the, the weight of a bigger thing minus the weight of part of it. So it's the weight of the leftover. And the leftover is the, the p between x2 and x1. So if I look at the total mass of a thing divided by its length, this is telling me its density. But it's telling me its average density. Uh, it's not that the density everywhere is the same. 
uh, it's at the length. It's that it's not an Athena an average. So this is what this average rate of change is representing. So I like this because he has nine to do with speed. Uh, and it's still measuring something we we know about. We understand what density is intuitively. If you pick up a, a small thing like a Nibbler's poop and it weighs a lot, you understand that what's happening there is density. Because you expect big things to be heavy and small things to be light. So what happens if I take if I look at this quantity and I take the limit of I take the limit of it as the as the as the piece I'm looking at gets smaller and smaller. So this is the density. This is the limit of the density of a piece whose length approaches zero. So if things go well for us, um, this limit will exist. And this limit will be um, this limit would be uh, what we call the the density of of the rod at the point x. So the derivative. So we can think of the the mass distribution in two ways. In one way, uh, one way is to just you tell me you tell me a chunk and I tell you the mass in that chunk. Or another way, which is very reasonable, is you tell me a point and I tell you there, I tell you there the density is one pound per inch. Um, and and the way to go from one to, from one to the other is to take the derivative. At least in one direction. In the other, you have to somehow go, go backwards from taking a derivative. So um, so that's it. That's a density example. Are there any questions? So with this, you wouldn't find the total mass, just the specific um, density at a point? Yes. I mean, uh, not just from the number of the total mass, but I knew the mass at any any chunk of it. So I had a, a whole function. Uh, so I could ask, what's the mass uh, between zero and one inch? What's the mass between zero and two? What's the mass between zero and three and a half? And with all that information, um, basically, if you wanted to plot it in a graph, uh, then the density is the derivative of the mass. So for example, here would look like we would look like this. <clears throat> um, but like I was saying, it's not super important for you to know the specific examples. The whole point is to just say that um, say that they exist. Say that derivatives show up in in real life, which they do. I promise you, they, they do everywhere. Um, okay, last example in physics: um, current. So, if you have a if you have a wire conducting electricity. how much electricity is passing through it. Um, uh, well, the question is, um, I mean, the question is, what is, um, Oh, I just realized. I don't know. I don't know the word in English. Um, intensity is it called? Oh, it's, it's called current. Yeah. The thing measured in um, 
So how do you measure currents? Well, not, I mean, not how do you measure, but how do you, how do you even talk about it? Well, you, you have your, um, what you do is you pick a point You pick a place in the in the wire, and you have your electrons moving through it. And what you're supposed to do is is you measure how much charge uh, how much charge has has passed after. Uh, time t so q for q for charge <clears throat> so then when you look at this function so this will well presumably will be an increasing function or maybe maybe not because charge could be going backwards and then i would say it's negative um we we'll say if it goes in one direction, it's positive. If it goes in the other, it's negative. Um, so when you take the increment in charge in a time interval, then you're measuring over some amount of time the, the charge that has passed in that interval. So, um, <clears throat> so this is giving you this is giving you a charge that passes over time, but again, it's giving you an average. If you want to uh, look at at this instant what the current is, well, I guess you know in in real life electrons you can't divide time infinitely, you can't divide electrons infinitely because they're literally one particle. Are they? I don't know. I, I don't don't question my physics, but I mean, if you don't get all quantum mechanics about it, uh, either a whole electron has passed or it hasn't. So you can't really take this limit, but you just pretend like you did because you can get close enough, a number small enough that it doesn't matter at all. So when you take the derivative of of the charge over time, um, you get um, you get instantaneous current. And notice that when you take when you take a derivative of something physical, something that has units, the the units of the derivative are the units of the of the quotient. So this is uh, charge is measured in coulombs as far as I know, and time is measured in second, and uh, uh, current is measured in this unit that I'm not sure I know how to pronounce. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be ampere or ampere or ampere or ampere, I'm gonna go with ampere. And and this is, I mean, these are the same. Um, and uh, and ampere is one coulomb passing uh, every second through your cable. Uh, so this is, I mean, has to do with speed a little bit, but it's not really, I mean, it's not, has to do, but it's not the speed at all. It's a, it's a completely different thing. And, and this same idea applies to, uh, a flow of a uh, fluid through a uh, through a pipe, for example, <clears throat> you can uh, measure this the same way, uh, or the flow of water through a river. All right. Um, what's the next example? All right. Um, so at this point, I guess. Um, 
we're happy enough with physics and we go into chemistry, another topic I know nothing about. Um, but um, one example, so I got two examples. One of them is that, uh, is the example of, of reaction speed. Um, so chemistry is about chemical reactions, as far as I know. And that's when, what, that's when you, have, um, you have some compounds, say in a solution and they they change what they change their um, their bonds between each other to make new compounds so um just to not risk anything i'm gonna go with uh, making water which is what the book does um so the question so one very important question in chemistry is how fast uh, the speed the reaction is going because uh, if a reaction happens but it takes a million years um, for all intents and purposes it doesn't happen um, and something I, I still remember from high school is that reactions uh, they don't they never happen completely right like you. Can I name any reaction? You, you mix vinegar and baking soda and they fizz and they make carbon dioxide and water. But is this a good example? I don't know. I don't have, but anyway, you, you take a chemical reaction and it doesn't, uh, you don't start with 100% um, reactants and you end with 100% products, but you end up somewhere in the middle. If, you, if, you're, if this is an industrial process, you have, you're very interested in, in using up all your, as much reactant as you can for efficiency to save money, uh, but it doesn't matter. And at the end, I remember that that's because the reaction is happening both ways. Every, every reaction is going um, back and forth. But if you see, if it looks like it's only happening one way, it's because one is much faster than the other. So in the end, it seems to be all about speed. So what is the, what is it? Well, I'm calling it speed. So obviously it's gonna be a derivative. Um, so if you have, um, if you have a reaction, um, something like you take A and it decomposes into something B and C. Uh, you look at, um, you look at the concentration. Um, of, or well, A, B or C, the concentration of something. Probably measured in moles per liter or something like that. Molars. <clears throat> and, and it's changed over time. So what, what is that gonna be? So the thing is the concentration is a function of time because as time changes, I get different concentrations. So this is gonna be uh, the change in, the change in concentration um, is gonna be either how much A has been created or negative how much A has been destroyed per liter. Um, and then divide that over time. So again, this is an average. Uh, and to really understand speed, we should be taking the, the limit over a small interval. And this is what the reaction speed is. And if something is getting confused, this will be uh, consumed. This will be negative. If something is getting created, it will be positive. Mm 
I think they usually call it reaction rates. So um, again, another derivative. Um, again, another topic I know nothing about. <clears throat> so um, let's get going. Another example. Um, the takeaway is that every time I'm writing a function, I'm writing the, the quotient of the increments, and then the limit has some meaning that we know. Well, I have a chemical exam today. Well, I know this didn't help you. So, um, any derivatives in your exam? Maybe this will show up um, because I'm still in the chemistry. So, um, I know because I've seen a balloon in my life that uh, pressure and volume of gases depend on each other. I also know that has to do with temperature, but honestly, I've never, I guess I've seen, I guess I've seen steam come out of a pot, which first of all, for a completely different reason. So the temperature thing, I just believe because I was still in high school, uh, but the pressure and volume thing, I definitely believe um, normally, the more pressure you put on the gas, the less volume, the, the smaller volume it, it um, occupies, and the and the, the smaller volume you make it occupy, um, the bigger the pressure it makes on the on the container. <clears throat> So I guess if you haven't taken physics or chemistry, whatever it is learned, um, the pressure the pressure is the force that the, the gas makes on the walls of wherever it's uh, sitting. The volume and the pressure are related. I remember one equation uh, I was told in class but apparently that equation never works in practice. So apparently if you take, so if you take um, the derivative of the, so you can think of, so this means that you would probably think of either as a function of the other. If you take the derivative of the volume respect to the pressure, so what does this look like? So is this positive or negative? Based on what I was just saying, what happens? So if I increase the pressure, well, don't say 50, 50, take a guess. Positive. Oh, <laughs> you played and you missed. Uh, if so, maybe it doesn't make sense. It makes sense. Um, if you if you look at the volume and the pressure, no, are we wrong? If you look at the the pressure and the volume, what tends to happen is if you increase the pressure, the volume decreases. So it looks something like this. This graph is facing down. The, the slope of the derivative and the, the slope of the tangent, aka the derivative, is, is negative always. Um, okay, so um, so this is this is negative. The if the pressure increases, the gas contracts. Uh, 
uh, um, so so the volume decreases. So what do I mean? If if the pressure increases, this means that the increment in pressure is positive. And if the volume decreases, this means that the increment in volume is negative. <coughs> you gotta write that on my symptom check. So you divide a negative thing by a positive thing, you get a positive thing, a uh, negative thing. So there's this thing that going to the book, honestly, never heard of it, but that would make sense because I have no idea what I'm talking about, um, which is the derivative, negative to the derivative of uh, the volume respect to the pressure. And this is called the isothermal compressibility. Um, so based on what people seem to be calling this thing, uh, I would guess I would get this. This is measuring how much this uh, gas likes to be compressed at, if you don't change the temperature. I think I'm hearing your TV. You have a question, Cole? They are inversely related. Uh, if you mean that as one increases, the other decreases, yeah. If you mean that they're inversely proportional, I think that depends. I don't know. I was telling class that they aren't, but apparently that was a lie. Apparently, apparently gases are never ideal gases. Um, if you leave this formula that I I had to learn in school. This would make them inversely related. But um, apparently this formula doesn't really work in reality. All right, Cole, I'm gonna guess you didn't have a question. I don't know if you're trying to ask a question from a noisy room or you're accidentally <laughs> unmuted. Let me explain. The first round when I died immediately when I was AFK. That was just like people playing a game. Did anyone hear a math question there? No, right? Right. Uh, right. <clears throat> Who the hell is, who the hell wakes up at eight to, to play video games? Maybe they're still awake. Uh, okay, so that's, um, so that's the gas. Uh, and I'm gonna finish the chapter today because really it doesn't matter if I go through four examples or five. Um, so, I'm gonna, so the next example is gonna be biology. So it says biology. The next example was gonna be the, the change, the, the growth in population. Someone did that in the first round apparently. So the derivative of people alive would have been negative in that case. Uh, but this example, so one example that's in the book is, uh, the, the population growth of a population of anything. But that's pretty much like speed. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip it in favor of something that I find more exciting, at least in newer. Uh, Uh, which is the flow of blood through a vessel. Which is, I guess, an application both to biology and to plumbing because probably the flow of um, any liquid through a pipe works similarly. So the thing is you have uh, a blood vessel, which is a tube. As we all know, half of them are red and half of them are blue. 
So, and, and blood is flowing through it, but um, when, when a liquid goes through a pipe, apparently, uh, it doesn't, it's not moving as a whole. Um, it's, it's not moving all at once, but what's happening is that the wall slows down the, the, the liquid from, from moving. So actually, um, the blood in the center travels faster than near the walls because the walls slow it down. So um, if you if you try to draw the speeds, it looks like like something like this. I mean, we're looking at the speed. It's just just at a at a little cross section of the of the vessel. This is probably pretty important um, when when the blood vessels are tiny, or when you're you know, when you have a problem obstructing them. So apparently, um, so you have, so one thing you have is if you, if I call this the distance from the center R, I call the radius of the vessel big R, turns out that there's a, so the, the speed and distance to the center are are related by a, a law uh, a law called the law of laminar flow um, so presumably it works when the when there's no turbulence which as far as I know is the opposite uh, to laminar flow Obviously not a formula you need to learn for this class, but uh, here it is. It turns out that the speed uh, is the pressure divided by four times the viscosity um, What's L? I copy in the formula, there's an L here. I don't, I don't know. Oh, well, it's the length of the tube. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so um, this is the, the pressure that is pushing the blood. This is the viscosity, which is, um, well, you know what the viscosity is. I don't know how to measure it, but I intuitively know what, uh, what, what it is. And this is the length of, of the vessel. So anyway, um, let's say, so we can probably say that these all are constants from the, the way I do the, the vessel. I mean, the, the pressure is the difference of pressure between one end and the other. So it's the same anywhere. Uh, it doesn't depend on where in the, in the vessel I am. So basically it's, the constant minus r squared. So for example, we can see that as little r increases, we get closer to the edge, this function is gonna decrease. Actually, it's gonna decrease to zero according to this. When both big r and when big r and small r are the same, they, the velocity is zero. So I guess blood is not moving in the wall of the vessel. And dv dr is the, the change in velocity as you move um, towards the wall.
All right. Um, and this is called apparently the velocity gradient because gradient is just another word for change. Okay, uh, so I left out a couple examples, but I don't care. Tomorrow I'm going to start with 3.7. Um, and I hope you believe that there's derivatives. Um, derivatives are necessary to do almost anything. And, and that's it. Uh, so as of right now, we 